you haven't done so yet, please pause the video here and try the question on your own before listening on. The question describes a moving electron and it's asking us to calculate the potential difference required to stop that electron. So why don't we draw a simple picture first. So here we have the initially moving electron whose speed is 2.85 times 10 to the seventh meters per second. And then because it's brought to rest, its final speed is equal to zero meters per second. Notice that because the electron is initially moving, it has an initial kinetic energy. But then when it stops, there is no kinetic energy. So in essence, we could say the final kinetic energy is equal to zero. That initial kinetic energy will end up equaling one half times the mass of the electron times the speed of the electron squared. Now, an important question to ask is this. Since energy is conserved, where does the kinetic energy go? I mean, the, the particle starts out with some kinetic energy, and then it ends with no kinetic energy, but energy can't just disappear, so where is it? And the answer to that question is that the energy has now been converted into potential energy. This would be analogous to a ball that's initially rolling along the floor that encounters a hill, and as the ball rolls up the hill, it is brought to rest. But when it gets to the top of the hill, it doesn't lose all of its energy. That energy is simply converted into potential energy. And that's precisely what's going on here. The electron initially has some kinetic energy because it's moving, and then when it's brought to rest, the energy is converted into potential energy. And we know that these energies have to be equal to one another through the conservation of energy. So we'll set them equal to each other. We just need to recall that the mass of an electron is equal to 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And so with that value for the mass of the electron as well as the initial speed of the electron, we are ready to calculate the final potential energy of the electron once it has stopped. And when you plug in the known values and calculate it on your calculator, you should get 3.7 times 10 to the negative 16th will equal the final potential energy. Now, just be careful because the question didn't ask for the final potential energy, it wanted the potential difference. But that's going to be relatively straightforward now because there's a nice relationship between the two. Let's take a look at it. We have the change in potential equaling the change in potential energy divided by the charge of the particle. Now, the change in potential energy can be written as the final minus initial potential energies. But recall that the initial potential energy was zero because initially there was only kinetic energy. So the equation simplifies. And then for Q, that's simply the charge of an electron, which is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. So we can plug in that for the charge, and then we have the final potential energy computed previously. So we plugged in the values. Notice that the unit for the potential energy was in joules. We forgot to put that down here. So now we can pick up our calculators and compute this, and when we do that, we should get approximately negative 2.31 times 10 to the negative 3 joules per coulomb. If for some reason your homework system wants it in kilojoules, then you can simply multiply your value by 10 to the positive 3, and that will convert the quantity into kilojoules per coulomb. So either answer is acceptable. Notice that a joule per coulomb is usually written as a volt. So we could say negative 2.31 times 10 to the minus 3 volts, or we could, for this answer, say negative 2.31 kilovolts would actually be this unit here. For part B, it asks, would a proton traveling at the same speed require a greater or lesser magnitude potential difference? And then explain. Well, we just have to know that the mass of a proton is much larger than the mass of an electron. It's something like 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And if you compare that number with the mass of the electron, you will see that the mass of the proton is almost 2,000 times greater. So if we were to go through and actually calculate the potential difference, the delta V, we would be plugging in a larger mass in for this quantity right here. Well, if this value was larger, then the final potential energy would indeed be larger as well. And then going back to our expression for the potential difference, which is the change in potential energy divided by the charge, if you have a larger final potential energy, then the numerator of this expression will be larger. And that means that overall the change in potential, or the potential difference, will also indeed be larger. So the correct answer to part B would be a greater magnitude potential difference because of the larger mass of the proton. Now part C is a little bit tricky, I suppose, though we just really have to keep in mind that when we calculated the potential difference for the electron, we ended up putting in the final potential energy divided by the 
charge of the electron. The same would be true for the proton then in that case. Now if we look back at our work, we recall that we set the final potential energy equal to one half multiplied by the mass of the electron multiplied by the initial speed of the electron squared. And so we can replace potential energy final with this expression here. And we'll do that for the electron as well as the proton. The only difference with the proton is that we would have the mass of the proton substituted in. So let's go ahead and do that. Now to produce the ratio that they're requesting, all we have to do is take the delta VP, which is this value, and divide it by delta VE, which is this value here. So let's go ahead and do that next. So here's the ratio of delta VP to delta VE. I admit this is a little messy, but fortunately the simplifying will clean this up. So there's a one half on the top here and a one half there, so those will cancel. The initial speeds are the same, so those terms will end up canceling. Also the charge on a proton and the charge on an electron have the same magnitude. It's just that the charge on the electron is negative. So as long as we put a negative sign there, we can cancel out the QPs as well. So actually this really does simplify to just the mass of the proton divided by the mass of the electron with that negative sign placed in the front. So that would be the correct answer to part C. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. If you liked it, please subscribe so you can stay tuned for additional videos that are similar to it. And then you're also welcome to send in your own question to the email address listed on the screen.